crack at him. We won't mention his name. Now. And uh, because he sat there and and there was willingness to sit there, but you could see the willingness to engage in, in an abstraction, a concept, a possibility, a consideration was all controlled by him completely. Now, it gets to the point where you do some of this, um, you know, old-fashioned, synonym, in-your-face confrontation stuff. And the truth is, with some of these young people, like, so, there's not, there's not so much willingness, but there's, a, there's some ability to connect with willingness that they're withholding, and that's two steps removed. And if you, if you browbeat them just right, if you confront them just right, they might say, all right, this is what you want, you know, like, the, you can finally crack them because, well, because there's, there's something implicit in how you deliver that that says to them, you're caring in just the right way. All right, you're caring in just the right way. You have a sense, this youngster really wants somebody to crack him. And then you get a sense, this youngster is terrified about being cracked. You know, and I, so you, you don't bring the same strategy. You don't hammer a screw, you use a screwdriver. You don't screw a nail, you use a hammer. You know, they look alike. They both hold wood together. But the right tool matters in that sense. And that's what I'm saying about the fit and the dance, you know. So if I'm built like a screw, you better bring screwdrivers. And oops, Phillips, not flathead, you know. <laughs> I'm going to be even more specific, you know. Bought the wrong screwdriver, right? Um, and not every hammer is big enough to handle, you know, a, a nail. And some hammers would break it, and, you know. So it's it's there's a there's a, an art and a science to this. And I think what the world wants to know. Are the people we should give up on? Now that's an important philosophical question because what I'm saying here, kind of scientifically, is maybe, maybe. And, and, and not that we should give up on them permanently, because you know nobody's God, nobody controls the future, the unfolding, the, rock, the next rock bottom experience, nobody controls that. And it could happen, you know, that somebody's 87 years old, they're near death, and they've been doing shit the same way. They could change in the next minute. They could have their epiphany, you know. It's kind of infinitely possible. But here, what we're talking about really are like odds. What are the odds? Our best efforts in the next three months moving in the direction of helping this person, pulling out all the stops, pulling out all the stops. Like forget money, forget manpower, forget any issue. Are there a group of people that we can't help? Are there a group of people that we want to give up on? So the truth of the matter is maybe there are in, in a technical sense, but really not an emotional sense, right? They're, they're still humans and there's still a scientific curiosity and we still got to try to address that. But we shouldn't put it, we should not be putting all of our resources there. That makes no sense. Right. right? How do we apportion our resources? We certainly should be noticing these people and help them as much as we can. They know people up front that have, you know, the, the high level commitment. Let's bring them, you know, our A game and, you know, like make a lot of good change. And we have to be able to prove that we can do that. And so that commitment factor, as you look at it, predicting of results, meeting high quality treatment all along the line. And then we're sort of left with this group, still scratching our heads, but still examining the question, not giving up. But not defining the whole group based on that dynamic either. Oh, addicts, you can't help them. I mean, that's ridiculous. Some, some of them help themselves. Right? They help right. themselves. So, I mean, you can't help them because they're an addict. I mean, so all these people that get identified as addicts, and I'm looking at commitment level, commitment level, commitment level. These people are going to be helped with rehab without walls. Significantly helped at low cost by the thousands. These people, if we improve what we do, you know, inpatient and outpatient, you know, in facilities, face to face with professionals, if we improve that, we make it more scientific and psychotherapeutic based, we will improve the outcomes. 
here's where we need really dedicated clinicians and people, you know, we're now getting down to this lower quadrant that, that are harder. And they're gonna need time, extra time, and it's gonna be a higher cost, right? We can't give up and, you know, three, three strikes, you're still in the game, right? Foul tip, you're still in the game. You know, how many strikes did it take, right? Wow. You know, a lot of strikes. Yes. Um, but we shouldn't give up, right? We should offer them high quality stuff. And over, oops, over here, we should at least be studying and maybe offering some of this, but realizing our percentages here are gonna be impacted by this group that has zero commitment. And the death rate's gonna be higher over there. That's all there is to it. Because another way to say this is, how much you, do you wanna live and how much do you wanna have a good life? How much do you want to live and how much do you want to have a good life? And you're stuck in the throes of addiction and you're answering a question and you're trying to say, I think, you know, like you're imagining, you're trying to fantasize. But it's a, it's a New Year's resolution, it's a pipe dream, it's a, it's, a, it's a foggy vapor that disappears by the afternoon. There's no commitment, but at least there's a spark of some interest. And later that might grow into something. And some people don't have that. And say, try to imagine a life, and I don't even want to. I just want to get the fuck out of here. I don't like this one. Well, and then, you know, you, you, you check yourself. You don't say, well, why don't you kill yourself? But you think the thought. So what keeps you here? And I don't know. It's, you know, usually some very, very personal commitment. You know, like a, my, my mother, it would hurt my mother too much, you know, or um, I couldn't do that to my husband or my kids or um, so, so for the sake of not really ruining somebody else's life, you're gonna you're gonna try and tough out this one that you can't stand. Okay. Now, you think about where a young guy we're discussing is placed on this continuum. Well, like like a lot of youngsters, he's somewhere over here, but we don't quite know because he speaks in code, right? They speak in code, so we see the defense. We know it's thick and deep. And we could get frustrated, particularly if when he said one thing, we thought he was over here, and then suddenly he jumps over here. Compulsion and trance, it's really what impacts this group over here and makes them feel powerless and hopeless. And, uh, and it's not unrealistic for them to feel that way. Powerless and hopeless, it's not unrealistic. If, if you were that sleepwalker, so the person you know, that I use as a prototype, walking at night to the kitchen, eating things, not knowing they were sleepwalking, waking up in the morning and seeing the wrappers and being astonished. Well, it's not even true that every one of these people has weight issues. Because during their waking life, they might not use food compulsively, but they are while they're half awake or asleep or whatever state they're in there. It's certainly not fully awake. Um, so where'd that come from? It comes from their will, just like every, every piece of your dream comes, you know, at night, every piece of that dream comes from your will. Now it's crazy, makes no sense, but it came, it came from you. You can't have somebody else's dreams, you know? I mean, you will generate them based on your will. And that, that's not the same as what you want, right? Because we think of that in language as like, I have a desire there. Um, you know, will means I bring it into existence and I act upon it based on my having brought it into existence. That's what will means. So here's the using, here's the pain relief, here's the, here's the you know, scratching the itch, here's the sucking on the pacifier, here's the, here's the compulsive gambling or sex or shopping or whatever else it is. And I'm speaking about commitment, not really fully understanding the power of this compulsivity or the nature of this compulsivity what what makes it that way and uh, you know in the folklore nobody has to address the question of what is compulsivity in any technical or serious sense you know it just makes stuff up and it's cliche and, you know it's when you act like a nut you know it, it's, it's when it's when you end up doing things that shock the hell out of you I mean we just have little cliche explanations for it nobody really understands it but or, or you get labeled bipolar 
we do in a manic episode. Absolutely, but but even then, you know, why did you do what you did when some part of you would say you didn't want to do it? Right. right? That, that's that's the essence of, of compulsion. Right. I don't know why I'm doing it. I'm doing it against my will. But see, it's not against your will. It's it's in it's in the expression of parts of your will that you don't understand or you can't validate, and that's where your self awareness is key. Why are why are you getting up at night going to the refrigerator? I think I miss my partner. He's no longer in bed with me. Okay, well, got to be a little Freudian there. You know how's that work? Well, there's a there's a hole in my heart. There's a longing that translates into a hole in my stomach. I feel it when I'm you know asleep. Instead of crying, I go eat. So why don't you set your alarm, wake up at night, and either go eat and cry, or just cry and go back to sleep. And you know what? That would cure you. That would cure the compulsion, if that's what it was based on. Right? So if you don't know that, you haven't investigated that, then you don't know that. And of course, you would never link up those things because they're all over the map. A little like you would not really understand your dreams unless you practice studying. What the hell was that symbolism? Why did that happen? And it's amazing how people are so fascinated with dream work and so clueless about their compulsivity. Right? Yeah. It's, in other words, it's the dreams that I dream when I sleep when I'm asleep that are sort of interesting, partly because they're harmless, although mysterious and you know maybe may meaningful, right? What about your compulsion? Because you're actually doing stuff in the real world with your behavior that involves risk and whatnot. You were compulsive for a long time. Yes. And if, you, if we look at your process, there's there's the talking head you that was saying, oh, I should stop this or I should quit or I'm sick and tired and you get into treatment. And the compulsive part would, would get the last word over and over again in terms of relapse, right? Yes. What the hell did I do that for? And you ask people who have had some sobriety who, um, who have kind of a surprise relapse, if they're totally surprised, you know what they always tell you? I had an inkling. I could feel it. Well, what were you feeling? What you feel is the fog of the trance coming over you. And uh, obviously, our trances are, you know, seductive in the sense of, you know, taking control of us. You know. There. Well, after a while, you know, you're you're wise enough to realize you're full of shit. Right. Well, and so I mean, so this is this is the difference between the adult and their commitment, and their level of responsibility. Um, even if even if they're committed to failing, they know more that that's true than the youngster, who can still deny that. Right, um, and and the youngster, in a way, hasn't simmered long enough inside his own self-deception to realize he's full of shit. And and this is an important turning point. And